um, this summer session. Um, uh, Lindsay, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks very much, Morgan, and thanks to everybody for, for coming. Um, this is, a, a, as Morgan has said, the first in a series of three which cover some of the, um, I suppose, the main revolutionary thinking in our tradition. And it's, it's a very interesting thing when you think that it's, um, you know, next year is the 200th anniversary of Marx's birth. Um, we've been told repeatedly that, uh, that Marx is dead and that it doesn't have any relevance in the modern world, all these other kind of things. And yet now, we're also told that the Labour Party is about to be taken over by Marxists and we're going to have a Marxist government and that, that everything will be terrible and, uh, and so on. So I think we're seeing a sort of a, a rebirth of interest in the ideas of Karl Marx. Now what, what I want to do today in the time I've got is just a very short um, introduction to some of those ideas and what he actually, uh, the reason that Marx was a, a revolutionary. And I want to start with a little bit of context because, uh, as I said, Marx was born in 1818 in a city called Trier, which is in the very west of, of Germany today. It wasn't, of course, Germany at the time that he was born wasn't a unified country and uh, consisted of lots and lots of different uh, of different states. And, um, and, and the, the area of Trier in which he was born. Was in in it was part of the Rhineland, which itself had been uh, occupied by Napoleon during the Napoleonic Wars, which were um, only a very few years uh, previously to that. It was an area which was known in um, in Germany and in Europe as, as an area of, of great liberalism and advanced ideas. And Marx came from a family; he came from a middle class family. His, his father was originally Jewish and. Uh, became a Christian, but it had very liberal ideas, and he was brought up in this kind of household, and he was brought up with these, uh, uh, with these sorts of ideas. And uh, the people of the Rhineland, as in many, um, many other parts of Europe, actually uh, benefited a great deal from some of the ideas that they developed as a result of the Napoleonic Wars and of the French Revolution, ideas of equality and democracy and of fraternity of all those ideas, and that was something which was uh, uh, which it, it would have influenced Marx in uh, in that kind of way. Now, Marx is um, is famous for his theories of what's called historical materialism, and sometimes called dialectical materialism. Or I I prefer the former title. I don't. I, I think it's much more explanatory. And what what basically Marx said there was, and, and Marx was a pupil of the great um, uh, German philosopher uh, Hegel, and he uh, he it's often said that he turned Hegel on his head. But whereas Hegel saw society as developing through a series of, uh, of clashes of ideas, for Marx, what happened was that it was the material forces as they developed, which clashed, the ways in which people um, made their living, the way in which they lived, the way in which therefore um, uh, they were forced to live in certain ways and, and to work in certain ways. It was those material forces which led to sets of ideas being developed and that those ideas then clashed with, with other ideas in society. So it was a very, very materialist uh, analysis. It was an analysis which understood that actually um, there were forces in history which which acted all the time in order to change society. They weren't. This wasn't an inevitable process. That uh, history wasn't just something that kind of moved forward. That sometimes it could uh, it could go in other directions. Sometimes you know you didn't see progress. And we can talk perhaps in the discussion about areas of the world where you didn't see progress as a result of uh, of uh, these sorts of uh, changes. But nonetheless. Um, he saw these historical forces, the changes in the way that people lived and worked, as being absolutely essential to understanding anything about history and about society. And I would argue that's still very much the uh, the case today. The, now, again, lots of sort of descriptions of Marx, and maybe you'll find you're going to say Lenin or Rosa Luxemburg or any of these thinkers that we're talking about today. People always talk about them as though they're kind of fully-fledged geniuses who just kind of, you know, 
were miraculously endowed with a set of ideas and personal characteristics which enabled them to uh, have a very, very big role in, in influencing social politics. Now, that really is bollocks to tell the truth about anybody. And, and even with Marx, who, who, you know, I think there's a very great case for saying that Marx was a genius in all sorts of ways, if you think of his contribution to ideas and so on, and his, uh, his, um, his absolute determination to, uh, to proceed in this way. But of course, Marx, like anybody else, was a human being. He made all sorts of mistakes. He did all sorts of things that were wrong. And of course, his ideas weren't separate from the society in which he lived and the people that he worked with and all of uh, those kind of things. There's two particular things I want to stress. And I've talked about his background in, in the Rhineland and so on, two particular things that I want to stress in terms of his, um, the influences on him and two things that made him a revolutionary. The first was, we, you know, we don't get a huge amount of credit here in Britain, perhaps rightly for being a sort of revolutionary society. Uh, it's only been Corbyn that everybody started getting interested again. But, you know, usually people think Britain's very sort of flattered and slow and nothing happens very quickly. But actually, at the time when Marx was a young man, when he was developing his ideas, there was a fantastic upsurge of working class struggle, mainly in the north of England, uh, not mainly in London, mainly in the north of England, around the Chartist movement. Um, this was uh, paid attention to much more by a man who used to become... Um, Marx's lifelong friend, who did a fantastic amount for him, for him personally and politically, and was uh, a devoted friend of Marx, Frederick Engels, who was also German, uh, born in the Wuppertal, and who, whose family had a factory in Manchester, a textile factory, which of course was the cradle of the Industrial Revolution and therefore the cradle of the, um, of the British working class. And, Engels' first trip to Manchester was actually in 1842, just after what had been a general strike, and probably, I'm not a great expert on, on this, but I think probably the first general strike in history, certainly the first general strike in, uh, in this country, and one which was absolutely um, a sign of the power of the working class. And Engels wrote a very um, well-known book called The Condition of the Working Class in England, not long after this experience, and this was something that he uh, influenced him profoundly. He became friends with Marx uh, not long after this, and both of them um, were very, very uh, profoundly affected by this power of the working class and the role of the political movement. And throughout their lives, I mean, right at the end of his life, um, or near the end of his life, Engels goes to the big. Um, May Day March in Hyde Park, which took place at the end of what, 1889, I think it was, or maybe it was 1890, one of them. Um, and there was this huge crowd, and it was the rebirth of the working class movement after um, year, after the new union struggles, and after years and years of, uh, of it not being a fantastically revolutionary working class. And Engel described it as, I saw the grandchildren of the Chartists in Hyde Park who were who were, uh, you know, demonstrating and all this kind of thing. So this was something that stayed with both of them all of their lives and was very, very important to them. The second thing, of course, which influenced them profoundly and which they were very central to was the revolutions which broke out in 1848 right across Europe. Um, now, I don't have time to go into them, but they went from um, Sicily right through to, well, the Chartist movement here was the, wasn't very successful, the actual 1848 bit of it, but you had the Chartist big demonstration on Kennington Common in 1848, that spread throughout, throughout the whole of Europe. It's said that the existence of the railways, which was very, very new technology, helped spread the revolution from uh, all these countries, and not least in Marx Naples' native Germany, which, of course, um, you saw an upsurge of revolutionary fervor. Marx and, and Naples went back to um, to the Rhineland, they were exiled, as they were for most of their lives, and as you can bet that after 1848 there was no question of them settling into a sort of professorship anywhere in Germany, and therefore that's why they both came to Britain and, um, and lived here. But the 1848 revolutions, even though they were ultimately unsuccessful, and particularly in Germany, they didn't succeed in unifying Germany and in leading to what Marx referred to as a bourgeois revolution, a revolution of the capitalist class, which would get rid of all the old um, 
feudal uh, trappings of, of society. Um, uh, although they were ultimately successful, they were a fantastic testing ground for revolution and for their revolutionary ideas. And Marx and Engels described themselves, because these were what were called democratic revolutions, they described themselves as on the extreme left of the democracy movement. Marx edited a, um, a newspaper during this time in, in Cologne called the Neue Rheinische Zeitung, which was a very popular uh, revolutionary newspaper. They played a very big role. Engels actually went and fought in the kind of revolutionary war, even after it was defeated in lots of Germany. They carried on fighting in the south of, of Germany. You know? And Engels was a great horseman and was involved in all of, in all of this. But again, he was eventually defeated. But that experience of 1848 um, impressed on the need for revolutionary overthrow, not gradual reform, which they, um, uh, they saw as not... Uh, as, as not dealing with the great material forces that needed to be uh, dealt with. But also they began to argue that although for capitalism to develop, you didn't need a working class revolution. In fact, if you look at the English Revolution or the French Revolution, you didn't have anything other than the well, not a working class at all in the 17th century here, and not really very much of one in, in France in the 18th century. So the argument has always been you'd have to have this democratic revolution, the bourgeois revolution. But actually, after 1848, they said that you have to now look much, much more at what they call revolution impermanence, that that had to be a constant. You couldn't just get a democratic revolution because, they argued, the forces um, of the bourgeoisie, as the working class grew, were more frightened of the working class than they were of the old order. So they would compromise with the old order, which is exactly what they tried to do in Germany. I mean, Bismarck had other ideas, so it didn't work. But that was what they were. They wouldn't. They didn't want a growing working class to be in any sense in this uh, important uh, situation. So those things both again influenced them all their lives. And again, when you read their their works, they talk about um, they talk about these things. Um, constantly, they refer back to 1848 and 1849 and all the, all the periods after that. Very, very important point. Now, at, around the time that, just before these revolutions broke out by a stroke of good fortune, they already published a, um, a book, a very famous book now, called the Communist Manifesto, which was kind of first draft by Engels and then embellished by Marx as far as we can from the uh, from the way that it worked, and it was it was uh, produced for their a very small organisation that they were part of called the Communist League, and the Communist Manifesto is still if you want um, a kind of encapsulation of what they believed, and again, although it's got bits in it that probably are kind of not very understandable to most of us today, referring to particular people and so on, but nonetheless the basic ideas are there, and uh, they are very. Um, uh, they're put in, you know, it's a short book, it's a very well written book, and it, it, it's put in very, very simple terms. What do they say about capitalism? Well, they say, just let me go for a few of the key things that they say. They say, firstly, and this is kind of different from how we would look at it today, they say that capitalism is a revolutionary system. They don't think it's all bad by any means, because they live, you know, they're in at the birth of capitalism, and if you look when uh, even in 1848, industrialisation is only a very, very partial thing across Europe, let alone what we see today with countries like China or the Philippines or any of these things. It was only partially in existence um, across, um, across Europe. So for them, they saw lots of good things in, in capitalism. They saw it as a way particularly of getting rid of the old order, of getting rid of the old ways in which people did things, of getting rid of the monarchies and the um, uh, and serfdom and slavery as you had still in the United States of America. They saw it as doing all of these uh, all of these kind of things, and they were very very keen on this. I mean, if you read Marx and Engels wrote massively about the American Civil War, which they were huge fans of the Union um, side, and and. Absolute, you know, detailed critiques of how the various generals were absolute rubbish and couldn't find their way out of the paper bag, and it was only when you had the Emancipation Proclamation that you began to see things moving. And, and you know, they were very, very. Why were they so keen on it? They were so keen on it because they understood that not just would it mean if, if 
the Americans of the war, one that you would get rid of um, the remnants of feudalism, even though it's a new country, but the remnants of feudalism and slavery and, uh, and backwardness. But also it would herald the emergence of a working class and the emergence of democracy. And actually, if you look, the victory of the North in the United States in 1865 did lead to a democratic process, both in England with you know, Big Deal, the extension of the franchise, but actually it was very much closely linked to that and of course to the revolutionary movement in in France in 1870 and 1871. So, you know, they they saw this and they saw this revolutionary system as being, in principle, a good thing because it laid preconditions for a socialist society. That's how they saw it. But, of course, and this is a very, very big but, they also saw it as an exploitative system. They said very simply this, that you have this system whereby a worker sells his or her labour power, they go to work in the factory, they have no choice but to go to work in the factory, you know, they're driven off the land because they work with the enclosures in this country, they don't have any choice, they go into these miserable cities that they have to live in, they can't pay the rent, the only way they can do this is they have to, all of them, sell their labour power to the capitalists in order to survive. Well, what does the capitalist do? Well, what the capitalist does is to say, okay, you work, and in most days, probably 12 hours a day, what we will pay you in your wages will be equivalent to the wealth that you produce, let's say, for six hours a day, and the other six hours wealth that you produce goes into profit. That was the basic system as it worked, and that was what Mark uh, talked about as an exploitative system. It was also what he called an alienated system. It was a system where the fruits of people's labour, unlike for most of human history, where people could see what they produced and see uh, what it was for, and very often they, just, they didn't even sell it or exchange it, they just used it, but they could see if they made something or um, grown a crop or any of these kind of things. When you talk about capitalism, you talk about the fruits of people's labour not just being taken away from them in the form of profit, and the, you know, it's axiomatic that car workers, for example, can't afford to buy new cars even though they produce them. This is uh, something which is uh, which is taken away from them, but also that you no longer feel that it's anything that you are in control of or that you have produced. In fact, in 21st century capitalism, I think it's very, very obvious that actually consumer goods control us rather than the other way around when you look at it. So he said this as well. He also said that this is a system which, is, however, not only is it something which destroys the ability of the worker to work in a way that they would want to, in a way that gives them any kind of satisfaction, but it's also a system which can't deliver for, well, for anybody. I mean, even in terms of the, uh, even in terms of the capitalist class. Why does he say that? He said, well, this profit, this surplus value which is extracted, what do they do with it? You know, and again, he uses, compared to feudalism, feudalism, the wealth that the Lord has, there's a certain limit to what you can do with it. You know, there's a limit to the size of the Lord's stomach, there's a limit to the number of castles you can build, there's a limit to the number of soldiers you can have in your, in, in your private army, all this kind of thing. Capitalism, there's absolutely no limits. There's absolutely no limit to the amount of and we see this again. We're seeing this on a, on a daily, uh, daily basis. And he said, "What happens then is that you pre you have, on the one hand, you have competition between different capitalists, which leads them to more and more investment, more and more production, more and more um, doing all of these kind of things, which means more, you know, the economy grows and more and more wealth in the economy. But of course, it's in the hands of the people who own." The profits, the capital, and, uh, and who keep it for themselves. It doesn't go to the people who produce the wealth. It also, in terms of what it does, it leads to overproduction. When everybody's competing to do more and more, then everybody produces goods. And at a certain point, not that people don't need these goods, that's a different argument about whether people need uh, the goods that are being produced, but the market will not sustain those goods at a particular price. Now, the most obvious example of this, I think, if you look in London today, is the housing market, where there is not a shortage of houses. In fact, you can go around looking at the weekends or at night, you can go around and you see no lights in houses, you see no windows open in the summer, you see none of this. Why? Because they make a profit for the people who, who build.
build them and who invest in them, but they're far beyond the reach of not just workers, actually, they say far beyond the reach of practically anybody to be able to, uh, to fly. So you have this overproduction, which of course then leads to a drop, then leads to a situation where too much is produced, so people are laid off and they're unemployed, and, uh, and all of uh, the consequences that we see with uh, economic, economic crisis in terms of human waste, in terms of financial waste, um, all of those different kinds of things. So, what else does he say on this before? I'm just waiting for about 20, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Okay, mm -hmm. only a, a, few, a few more. Okay, well, not that long, so I'll, I'll try. Okay, what, um, so what does Mark say about this whole process, this process of uh, the extraction of the surplus value of the crisis of overproduction of all of, of those different things? What he says is that this relationship he, he talks about the relationship of exploitation of, of people um, uh, producing, producing goods and um, having the, uh, the surplus value taken, taken from them. He says that this leads to class struggle and he sees this as a constant kind of antagonistic relationship between the two, what he calls the two contending classes. Now we can perhaps discuss what people think of class today and uh, the extent to which it's different from, from when Marx uh, wrote. But I would argue that today the vast majority of people um, fit into the category of working class in the sense that they have to sell their goods um, and they and they have to do this in order to exist. And there's a small minority of people who fit into the category of what he called the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class, the people who own or sometimes control the um, the capital and the and the profit and so on. Now obviously it's more, you know, society is more complicated, industry is much more complicated and so on. But I would argue that those basic uh, relationships still um, still uh, exist. Um, he talks about this class struggle as now hidden and now open. In other words, people are, as we know, and perhaps to our regret, people are always out on the streets with placards and um, striking, demonstrating, and doing all these sorts of things. Uh, actually, class struggle takes all sorts of different forms, and sometimes people just think, firstly, it isn't possible. You get a huge amount of um, what you might call individualised class struggle, if you wouldn't put it in those terms, sabotage. Um, I went to an interesting little paper that somebody gave about sabotage by car workers in one particular area of Poland. The other day, you know, people when they're on the night shift and there's no cameras or they just log cameras at the cars and various stuff like that. Now, that's a form of class struggle. It's not particularly sort of class conscious, maybe or focused, but and certainly not kind of. Um, it's not from the sort of Marxist textbooks, I suppose, but it is a form of class struggle. Going off sick is a kind of form of we're fed up with these people uh, making the choice. Not liking the manager. Now, who doesn't ever go to work and moan about the manager? It's practically, you know, de rigueur. All of those sorts of things are part and parcel of what he calls class struggle. But he says this is an antagonism which will come out into the open and will force people to fight, even if. They don't see themselves as workers, even if certainly they don't see themselves as socialists or Marxists. That isn't the criterion. The criterion is that objectively they are being exploited, and therefore at certain points they decide that they're going to have to do something about it, and that's the way that it um, it works. Now, what just just finally, to put it, when I tell you about Marx talks about exploitation, overproduction, all these sorts of things. His answer to this, he says there's only one answer to this, you cannot change this individually. You know, individual workers can get pay rises, individual workers can become managers or foremen or all these sorts of things, individuals can do all these sorts of things, but you cannot change this system individually. It has to be something which is done collectively and it has to result in what he calls social production. It has to result in production not for the profit of one particular company or one particular individual or any of these things, but production which actually can solve the problems of humanity itself rather than rather than looking in those sorts of terms. And he says that can only come through revolutionary change. Now, in the course of his lifetime, I would just argue there were two things that are particularly important. I haven't got time to talk about them. Well, I would say he enables 
really quite, in a big way, quite changed their, their, their views. One is I've already referred to, which is the situation after 1848 when the bourgeoisie really ceases to be a revolutionary class and a progressive class but becomes a much more reactionary and conservative class and therefore they see the need for the working class for working class organisation um, for all of those things they see that much more clearly after that. The second of course is that he sees the role of the state um, in stopping you know, that not just that individual capitalists don't like their wealth being taken away from them, but the role of the state, um, the capitalist state, being used in order to um, prevent socialist revolution. And he sees this most dramatic. I mean, Marx uh, thought that in certain circumstances you wouldn't need um, revolutions in countries like Britain because you had some, wasn't very good democracy, but you didn't have the kind of autocracy that you had in um, Germany and, and Austria and so on. And then we thought there could be different ways of getting there. That was all abandoned really after 1871 when the Paris Commune was drowned in blood by precisely the people who uh, were acting on behalf of the capitalist class and who used the state machine, used the army, used all these sorts of things to, um, to overthrow. Uh, the Paris Commune, which was the first attempt of workers' government, the first real democratic workers' state, I mean, for two months in Paris, but it was a tremendous achievement by the people that, by the people there. So those two events, I think, particularly led to Marx kind of reassessing uh, what that actually meant in terms of the state, which, of course, next week, for again, we'll talk much more about this with Lenin and, you know, with Lenin. If you look at Lenin in 1970, you go back to Marx and the Paris Commune all the time to look at what we should be doing, how we can do this, all those kind of things. So anyway, that is. Let me stop there because that is kind of, you know, my introduction to um, to the ideas of Marx. Obviously, it's a very, very sketchy introduction in terms of all sorts of things. So hopefully, people will bring up all sorts of different questions in the discussion. <laughs> size of enterprises, the scope of enterprises across the world, you know, the, the, really the neoliberalism was represented in opening up of the free market absolutely everywhere, pretty much absolutely, uh, absolutely everywhere. Um, and, you know, and with it, a, a sort of an ideology that there is no alternative, which we got for a, for a long, long time. Now, I think the scope and the size of the enterprises isn't something which is generally necessarily bad for socialists, because actually, famously, if you look at even in 1917, for example, the, the size of the Russian factories was so immense that they reckon this was one reason that people were able to organise in, in uh, Petrograd, um, in Putilov and, and those sorts of things. That actually, it gave them a big audience, if you like, and, and you could argue this about the spread of capital to different countries, you know, that you now have, um, whatever the, the downsides of that, and there have been many, many downsides for people in, in, working people in all the countries concerned in terms of either losing jobs in countries like Britain or having to go into jobs in countries like, say, in Eastern Europe for worse wages and worse conditions than, than they've had. But I would say that actually this opens up the possibilities for the socialists in a way that, um, that we haven't had um, before. In terms of the thinkers who've arisen since Mark, well, obviously there's the thinkers in uh, the tradition of, um, of Marxism, you know, the people that are... Uh, and of Marxist activism, because the interesting thing about it, if you look at Marx, Engels, Lenin, Rosa Luxemburg, Trotsky, all of them actually were active, you know, they were intellectuals in the sense they wrote and they uh, certainly knew the arguments, but they were all activists. I mean, Marx was involved in trying to tear down the gates of the railings of Hyde Park in 1867 or 1867. 
1906 when they had the campaigns for democracies. I mean, it wasn't just a, you know, this view of him as this old sort of git who just sits in the <laughs> British Museum and just, you know, writes all the time and gets car bundles and that. That's a kind of distortion of him. He was a, you know, he was somebody who obviously had a revolutionary spirit throughout his whole life. And, um, and certainly his three daughters, who were all, um, you know, they were his three surviving children, were all socialists who were, uh, one of them died quite young, well, they all died quite young, um, uh, compared to, to today. One died um, uh, while, he was still, while he was still alive. But they were all socialists involved. Uh, two of them were married to the Frenchmen, they were involved in the Paris Commune, and they were involved in all this, uh, this kind of thing. So I think he, uh, those activists were tremendously important. And when we come to talk about Rosa Luxemburg and Lenin, the whole l connection between theory and practice is very, very clear, because actually, Socialist theory is condemned practice, if you look at it, it's people interpreting uh, what happens. In terms of other thinkers, uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots of, you know, you think of historians, I mean, again, you might disagree with some of their analysis, but if you think of E.P. Thompson, or if you think of Hobsbawm, or if you think of those who actually tried to apply a Marxist critique of what was happening in history, and I know when I was doing Tudors and Stuarts from my A-level in the 60s, I mean, they used to say, don't read Christopher Hill, because that was, you know, considered very, very dangerous Marxist stuff. Um, but they're very important. Obviously, there's been economists, there still are economists like David Harvey, who I guess would consider themselves um, uh, Marxists, but in all areas of, of uh, cultural studies, of um, uh, literature, of all these things, you, you, there's a... You know, there's a science. I mean, if you look what the Russian Revolution did, it produced lots of ideas around science, around psychology, around all sorts of things, which are, which are still regarded very, very seriously today, even though obviously there's been lots of thinking since then. The point that that um, Kira made about the 2008, yeah, I mean, it's incredible, really, to think it nearly is 10 years. It tells you how slowly sometimes the impact of these things is. Um, I mean, obviously, it, it came sort of quicker in Greece. We've had, as you say, the Latin American experience, although that's going into reverse in quite a bad way now, if you look in a whole number of, uh, a whole number of countries now. But, yes, I mean, that's... Uh, but in general, in terms of uh, Western Europe, um, You've got to say that the first few years of this, the right probably benefited more than the left, and actually it led to some crises and fragmentation with some of the left in the country. I think that's beginning to change. Certainly here, I mean, here we're in a good situation. I mean, as I said at the beginning, we don't, you know, we're always sort of the usual British sort of grumbling and so on. But it's, um, you know, it's an incredible situation we're now in, a very open situation where you've got an extremely weak government. And where you've got Jeremy Corbyn, I think, extremely likely to be the next Prime Minister, which is not a sentence I ever thought I'd say you know, <laughs> a few years ago, you know, or even leader of the Labour Party. So, I mean, and that's opened up a lot of ideas about people. You hear people talking about politics much more. You see people doing that. I mean, all the things that... Durham Miners thing last weekend. Was it last weekend? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Time moves so quickly all the time. It seems like ages ago. But you know, the number of people now on the streets doing things involved, I'm sure Toll Club will be bigger this year than it is, has been in previous years and so on. You know, you've got this a political radicalisation. Now, then the question, which kind of leads on to Isabel's question really, is okay, what does this mean? If it's just going to be Labour government next year or the year after, with, you know, suddenly even Tony Blair or so, it's Jerry Corbyn's done quite well getting all these young people out, all this kind of thing. If it's just going to be that, with a Labour cabinet buffeted by the um, money markets, by big capital, by threats from the City of London, all of which we're already getting, but we'll get with knobs on, really, when, um, when uh, there is a Labour government. So, to me, Labour government led by left wing with a good left wing program, fantastic. Is any of this going to happen without outside struggle? I don't see it. I mean, even if you look in terms of, you know how they do everything from the BBC to government committees and so on, everything. Is the Southern Railway thing the fault of the RMT or is it an ASLET or is it the fault of the 
company. Well, it's kind of somewhere in the middle, and everybody's got to have a bit of give and take, and maybe we can privatise, a, we can nationalise a bit, but not everywhere, and let's not do it too quickly, and we've not enough money. We can all write these articles now, coming from The Guardian and absolutely everybody else. So I think then the crucial question is, firstly, that you do have a Labour leadership, which is consciously left-wing. Now, I don't think Jeremy actually is a Marxist. I mean, I'm not sure he would say he was a Marxist, but, you know, ever. I mean, I don't know. It's a question you have to ask him. I don't know whether that's a good idea these days. It would be in the sun or something, whatever it's answering. Um, I mean, John McDonnell probably more so in terms of his history, but... You know, again, they're two individuals. I guess there aren't that many more people who even think of themselves as Marxists in the parliamentary Labour Party. So, okay, how does this work then? We've got to get much higher levels of industrial action. We've got to get much higher levels of street, street action. We've got to put a fantastic amount of pressure, not just on the government, which is in a very weak position, but on the employing class. You know, if you look, I mean, again, this disgusting report from Matthew Taylor this week. Um, you know, it's absolutely appalling, really, you know, when you actually look at it. Because what it says is, we're not going to get rid of zero hours contracts. We're not even going to guarantee minimum wage. And you see, some of these things can make a huge difference. So, I don't see revolution coming just from the streets. I think it will be, but I think there have to be alternative centres of power. And again, we'll talk about this next week much more with, with Lenin. I think there have to be alternative centres of power from Parliament, because, I mean... Apart from anything else, Parliament is fairly weak and feeble, even with a good government in it. You know, if you look, there's been hardly any votes since the election, because they dare have a vote because they'd lose it. So they can't have a vote on anything that's controversial, so consequently there's virtually no votes. Now really, people should be going crazy about this and saying, look, come on, if you can't even have a vote, get out and we'll have an election. And then, of course, we're told nobody wants an election, apart from every Labour supporter in the country. <laughs> you know, nobody really wants one, it's very disruptive. You know? Um, so, you know, but, but essentially, you have to have, uh, you have to say, okay, we're going to build our power as a working class, which is a, I think is a very broad concept <coughs> these days. I don't think it's, you know, it's about the workplaces, but it's also about what people do in communities. I mean, do the people in Grenfell have a lot of power they do if they use it and whether they use it is another matter do people in colleges have a lot of power actually they do if they use it you know and i think it's a question of getting all those those people together and how you actually then challenge state power but the challenge you state power has to happen at some stage because you know these people are never going to say thank you very much you all got it right we all got it wrong um you can have our money that's just, <laughs> just not going to happen you know class and how the class system works. You see, I, I think if you're looking at class in the 21st century, you can't see it in a way that people saw it in the 19th century. I mean, for example, when you look at um, the number of clerical workers that were, if you look at, for example, um, the Christmas Carol, you know, Charles Dickens, I mean, you've got Bob Cratchit, who's in a miserable situation anyway, but he's, he's definitely a cut above most of the manual workers in in that uh, that society, um, and that was generally the case for clerical workers. Right into the, the late nineteenth century, maybe even the twentieth century, they generally seen as slightly not that they weren't workers, but they had they got more benefits in terms of the kind of wages that they got. Now, I think if you look <coughs> in the last century, you have to say that. White collar workers, what we call white collar workers, clerical workers, people who work in, in shops, people who work in offices, all of those sorts of things. I think you have to include the vast majority of them as part of the working class. So therefore, to me, a bank worker would be part of the working class. And interestingly, if you look at what's called, <coughs> for example, bank workers, like before the First World War, no woman was allowed to be a bank clerk at all. It had to be all men. It was very, very respectable kind of job and again would have been paid enough so that those people could live in a sort of respectable, probably still a terrace house, but you know, respectable house in Woolwich or wherever, you know, um, that kind of thing. Now if you look today at bank workers, you see a totally different 
situation. You see a huge number of women working in them, you see ethnic uh, minorities working in them. That's not to say all women are workers or all ethnic minorities are, but actually the vast majority are, if you look at um, yeah, certainly in British, uh, in British society. So I think there's been that kind of change. And to me, you have to see the working class as defined not by what, whether it wears overalls or not, not whether it works in the factory, because far fewer people do, but whether or not it is having to sell its labour power, in which case it becomes part of the working class. Now, there are some exceptions to this when you go higher up the managerial chain. I mean, I would say a lot of managers essentially fit into the working class. I mean, if you were a lower manager in Sainsbury's, you get, you know, I don't know, you're still probably only on the average wage or only slightly above it. And all right, you're, you're telling 10 people what to do, but you are subject to exploitation by the top managers, exactly the same as... Um, as the people who work on the checkout. So I think it makes sense to incorporate those people in it. And certainly in lots of unions, um, both in terms of things like journalism and the media, or in things like higher education, and in, um, in schools, you find that actually people in managerial positions, are oh, by and large, they're in managerial positions where still they, were expo they are exploited, rather than them sharing in the surplus value of the Capitalist. But obviously, the higher up you go the chain, then that that does begin to uh, that does begin to change. The question of why Latin America has failed is obviously a massive question, and is and, and you know it's obviously varied. I mean, it's a huge continent. It's obviously varied in terms of uh, in terms of what's happened there. I mean, I I would say just just very very quickly a couple of things. I think that. You know, if you're going to go for what Chavez did perhaps most successfully in Venezuela, you've got to think about how you empower working class people to take control of their own lives. And I don't think that's been done. I don't think it was done in Brazil. I don't think it was, you know. So that means that people are then prey to all the right wing propaganda, all the, um, and, and just generally getting fed up with governments, which people do, you know. Governments get elected people enthusiastic, they don't get what they want, they get fed up with them. But that's a kind of, you know, that's happened a bit to the SNP in Scotland in this election, you know, for example. But it's a, you know, you, I, I think it's, it's, you could have developed organs of workers' power, popular power, all those sorts of things. That hasn't by and large been done in those countries. And I think, therefore, the left governments are really suffering. Now, they're suffering, you know, because also American imperialism in particular is staging soft coups and doing all sorts of stuff. But that's, you know, that only succeeds. It didn't succeed when they first did that against Chavez. You know, if you watch the wonderful film, it didn't succeed then. People came out on the streets. Now, they're not going to do that for Maduro. That's absolutely obvious. That they're not going to do the same process. So, I think you've got to look at extending. You know, and this is very relevant for us with the, the possibility of Jeremy becoming Prime Minister. And, you know, lots of us know Jeremy. I, personally, I would trust Jeremy Corbyn as a, you know, which isn't something I'd say about a lot of politicians, but I think he's one of the most trustworthy politicians. <laughs> Does that stop him from being prey to all these problems? No, it doesn't. And I think we have to look at it in that way. The point that, that Judy made about the, um, the public sector, that people are paid by the government, <coughs> I think there's two points here. Partly now, lots of the, of the public sector actually are now profit, directly profit-making. I mean, if you look at university lecturers, for example, you know, that we're tied to, you know, the fees, to performance, to all this kind of So you can make an argument that you're directly, and to a certain extent with schools, you know, that you're directly um, benefiting and, and um, being exploited in that, kind of, uh, in that kind of way. But also, I think we have to see the public sector. And when did it develop? After the Second World War, during the long boom, when actually capital recognised it needed a better educated workforce, it needed a healthier workforce, it needed all those sorts of things. And therefore, it is paid for, if you like, collectively out of our taxation, but also, to a certain extent, out of private capital, because they understand it increases the level of exploitation. So if you are teaching kids, and they are numerate, and they are skilled in various ways, that is better for British capital when they come to, to employ them, that, 18 or, or whenever it is. So, I would say that. Um, and yeah, the point about the process of organising helps people realise their own, their own power. 
And I think it's absolutely true. If you don't do these things for yourself, you don't know. And that's true as activists. That, and you have to be active, even if it's a tiny thing. I mean, sometimes people think, you know, it's all awful, nothing's going to change. Quite often we think that, don't we, socialists, especially the older ones, and it's all bloody awful. Nothing's ever going to happen. But actually, even in times that are bad, and let's face it, we haven't had absolutely terrible times, and we haven't had to live through factions and the military coups and, and so on. But even in times that are bad, you can do something. You can have a victory. You can win victories. You can stop a victimisation of somebody at work. That's not much, but it is important. And also, it gives you a sense of what can be done politically. Because, you know, all these people say, oh, I was absolutely shocked at the election result. Now, I bet you that most people who were involved in that election campaign, or enthusiastic for Corbyn, weren't completely shocked. I'm not saying we predicted the result. I wasn't completely shocked. I kept thinking, he's doing very well here. And then people kept saying, oh no. I mean, I was on a television program with a guy from the Tory party at seven o'clock on election night, when I'd just driven across London and seen all these people with red t-shirts canvassing for Jeremy Corbyn. And he's going, no, 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 we're going to get a majority of 70 to 100. Now, that's what they're saying when nearly everybody is voting in this election, and they must have some idea, or maybe they don't, I don't know. But, you know, the truth is that most Corbyn people have been taught that you must be too enthusiastic because it's all going to end up badly because we've all sat through elections where it all went dreadfully wrong. But actually, we're more in touch. The same as if you go to a picket line, you're more in touch with what people are saying. If you travel on a bus, you're more in touch with what people are moaning about and, you know, how bad is the transport. If you commute anywhere, you know what people think of nationalisation of the railways. So, yeah, I think that's very important. Now, just the final point that the sister raised about Sudan and about living in Belgrade and, and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, look, You've got countries, that, and, and not just countries that have got small working class. I mean, there's a whole, if you look at the wars in the Middle East, what's that done to working class organisation? Well, made it impossible, really, in, in most places. It's just, it's just not an option because people's lives are so grim that they, you know, they're displaced, they're traumatised, all sorts of things. They have to do all these kind of things. And so, therefore, it's a question okay, then when we're looking at can we do things in Sudan? Yes, of course we can. I'm sure lots of people do do things, but it's not centred on the industrial struggle uh, and so on. But can we also then say, okay, have we got international solidarity, which links up? Because that's very important in places where people are particularly badly affected by those things. And I would just say in Eastern Europe, where, you know, I mean, I teach uh, European employment relations, and the story in Eastern Europe is pretty grim for the last... How many years? 25, 30 years, you know. I mean, war in, in Belgrade, obviously, but even when people haven't had that, driving down of living standards, destruction of a lot of what people have. Now, I, it seems to me, from the story in Belgrade and other things that you hear, there's still the possibility of more wars in that region, it seems to me, but there's also, there are lots of things now coming through. There's an article in the Financial Times, actually, the other day, saying, they're very, very, they're having to pay huge wage increases to people in Slovakia in car factories because they haven't got the skills because all the Slovakians have emigrated, or lots of them have emigrated because they couldn't get wages. Now there's, and they invested in Slovakia because they only paid them half what they pay German workers, or a third of what they pay German workers. And suddenly people are beginning to fight back. So I think even in the most surprising places, you get new generations that come through and they begin to think, well, okay, Let's give it a go. What have we got to lose? And I think we're seeing this movement now in lots and lots of countries, which will develop in different ways in different countries for all sorts of reasons. But I think it's very, very encouraging, you know. Okay. Um, well, that first question that, you know, you asked about... Um, hegemony, and I, mean, I, I, I agree with what uh, with what Chris has said. But I also think we need to be a little bit careful about this analysis of labour. Is this two kind of, you know, you've got traditional working class, and then you've got these middle class sort of metropolitans who all, you know, uh, are very liberal and all this kind of thing. I mean, there's an element 
of truth in it. But I mean, I think firstly, a, a friend of mine's actually doing a um, a study of some of these labour seats that we're talking about, and you know, which he's going to put up somewhere in the next few days. So I'll put it up on Facebook. But he said that he thinks this is massively over exaggerated. That a lot of people still. I mean, there's all sorts of complex reasons why people don't vote anyway. I mean, it's weird when you actually, you know, it's not, it, it, you'd think it was very rational and logical and people spend ages thinking about it, but actually they don't. And sometimes they do things for all sorts of odd reasons and vote in a particular way for all sorts of things. But anyway, he was saying that he thinks it's very much over exaggerated. There's five people on the right of the Labour Party who want to say this is all about immigration, and not just immigration, but about trying immigration. Wars, Jeremy Corbyn not singing the national anthem, all of it, you know, that, that sort of general sort of patriotic sort of approach to politics. And actually, if you look at it, if you look at the seats that Labour lost in, um, in this last election, which was, I think, five in Middlesbrough, Derbyshire North, um, Walsall, um, I can't remember the other two, but anyway. Um, one of the Stoke seats they lost, didn't they? I mean, these are all areas that people talk about, you know, don't have big universities, don't have big migrant populations, quite old populations, quite high UKIP votes. So, of course, there's an element of, of truth in this, but there's all sorts of other elements. And then you look at some of the seats they won, like they won in Crewe, which is pretty similar. They won in Derby North, which is pretty similar. So, you know, there's a subjective element as well, which I think we need to look at. And it also... Uh, kind of, I mean, you know, we live in London, we think of London as multicultural as it is and non-racist, but that isn't actually true. We know there's a lot of racism in London, if we're honest. We know these these attacks that have been going on, at least some of them are obviously racially motivated, these um, acid attacks and so on. Um, so, you know, uh, so, uh, and there's plenty of racists in London. I mean, you know, so so I think we've got to look at a more. Um, we've got to say it's possible to win people. It's clear to me it wasn't mainly. If you look at actually, you got did a poll on this this week. So I think 13% said they voted Labour because of Jeremy Corbyn. 28% said they voted Labour because of the manifesto. Yeah. And I think above everything, if you're saying to people, and this will be true in Middlesbrough, it'll be true in Stoke, it'll be true in these people. Can you say to them they're going to have a council house or their children will have a council house or somewhere decent to live that doesn't cost them very much? Can you say that their children will have a job? Can you give them a decent house? I think whatever their attitudes towards the military or towards, you know, even towards immigration, uh, you would see a different attitude and they would be pushed to the left. Even with immigration, it's generally accepted that there's a hard core of racism in this country, which is a kind of between... 15 to 20 percent of the population, which strikes me as about right when you think of your own experience with these sorts of things. But actually, most other people, when they talk about immigration, what they mean is immigration and I'm fed up because I can't get a doctor's appointment or I'm fed up because I, my child can't get their first place at school. And these are all big issues. I mean, they're big issues everywhere, actually. If you talk to people you know, who, are, who are using these services everywhere, they're what people talk to, talk about. And so I think it's a question of saying the hegemony, can you begin to break down whatever the cultural insecurity is connected with material insecurity, can you break that down? Can you say, and when people have, you know, usually most people, I'm not saying there aren't exceptions, these are people who go off and join the EDL and all this kind of thing, but you know, most people, when they're kind of okay, they don't think, who am I going to kick? They don't think, what am I going to do that's really awful? They start thinking about, you know, how they can make their society better. So I, th I think it's important to see it in this, um, this context. Now, uh, the question about revolution and permanence. The, uh, Hal Draper, in his book, I think it must be, I don't know if you, would, if you want to read more about Marxism, it's very, very good, his commentaries, there's several volumes of them. I think it's the one on the state where he talks about this, which is first volume. But Hal Draper, who was an American Marxist, writes very well on this, that actually by the end of the 1848 revolution, both Marx and Engels are saying, look, what was happening was the working class and the poor were getting too strong in the revolutionary process. 
And the bourgeoisie was so useless in Germany, which it was, so feeble and divided. I mean, Marx uses the example of one of the parliaments that is set up during 1848. I can't remember if it was in Frankfurt or in Berlin, but he says it's like a star that's already... The light from this parliament is like the light from a star that's already died. Which was pretty... <laughs> it's pretty advanced to write this in the 1840s, actually. And he says, you know, it's already... Whatever is good about it is gone. So he says, what we're looking at is... And I think it was Engels who used the phrase, the executioner is waiting at the door. The executioner is the working class. So of course, what does the bourgeoisie do? Well, they don't open the door because they don't want the executioner coming in and they make their peace with the old order. And what he's saying about revolution and permanence is a bourgeois revolution isn't going to cut it. It isn't going to cut it at all because what it will mean is that... Um, whatever parliaments are set up, whatever democratic rights that people have, legal rights and so on, none of this is going to challenge any property relations. And this, of course, became very important when you talk about Russia, because all socialists, up to pretty much all, actually not, not Trotsky, but most of them, pretty much all up to 1917 thought that it would be a democratic revolution in Russia, because God knows they needed one, you know, I mean, it was the most backward, autocratic aristocratic, terrible society without proper democratic institutions at all. But actually, by 1917, it's obvious you had to move beyond that to, to, uh, to do anything that would actually change anything, which was basically what it came, what it came down to it. Um, how does the trade union movement change itself to give Labour support? Well, this is a very big question, because we know with lots of the trade union <coughs> leaders, you know, I mean, that's what Labour's been based on, is, is an alliance with the trade union leaders. And they're not great, really. I mean, they're not... Some of them are. I don't want to be rude about all of them, but some of them play a good role and, and so on. Most of those aren't affiliated to the Labour Party, actually, when you, you actually look at it. You know, if you look at the big unions, you know, then they've always thought their role was to tell Labour governments what to do. And they got very fed up when Tony Blair wouldn't let them do it, but they didn't really lead a fight even then. Now... I mean, I think there has to be, bottom line, there has to be a much higher level of industrial struggle to really achieve a lot of the things that people want. I think there will be a higher level of industrial struggle, actually. I think there already is the sign that there's more people coming out and strike. And interestingly, because of the trade union laws are so restrictive now, they're doing it for more than a day. Because once you've voted and gone through it, you haven't got that much long time to do it, people are saying, all right, we'll come out for a week. And you've got, you know, groups like the British Airways and the hospitals in East London and all these sort of things. So that's very encouraging. There's got to be loads more of that and a shift away from sort of relying on Parliament and relying on Labour towards relying on the power of trade unions themselves to do it. Um, just finally, I mean, Chris um, made a number of uh, points about, you know, the relationship between... Parliament and outside, and about bringing down the government. I mean, I think it is so obvious now, when you look at British society, what the most appalling state it's in, actually. I mean, really, you, you've got every area of it. Huge crisis in social care for older people. Huge crisis in the schools. Huge crisis in the university. They're all going to have to scrap tuition fees. Who's going to pay for it? You know, that's what they're thinking. I mean, we're thinking, well, they can pay for it. But what they're thinking is, who the hell? This has been a business model that they're going to have to abandon at some point in the next few years. What's going to happen? The Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea is it's laughably known. I mean, really, why are these people still allowed to run a council? Why are they still allowed to have anything to do with housing? You know, it's, it's absolutely disgraceful at every level. You know, you see the rich and powerful not only protected by the system, but unable to deliver very, very basic things that people need. And in that situation, you know, again, we'll move on to talk about Lenin next week. You know, that's when the era of revolution opens up, when you, when the old order can't, you know, when the ruling class can no longer rule and the working class can't live in the old way. Then, and that's what's happening, really. And it's happening very acutely in this country. You know, there's, you're seeing it in a way that you you don't see. Well, I'm not saying there's not a big crisis in other countries, but I think it's very acute in Britain at the moment, and that is um, a big opportunity for the left.
Okay. Um, okay. Um, well, just a few, just a, uh, these points. I mean, <laughs> I agreed obviously with most of the um, the points that have been made. I mean, you know, Mark's point uh, about the division between young and old and uh, rural and, and urban. I mean, the young and old one is astonishing, really, because actually, if you look at um, it all seems to be based on people's voting patterns. Even then, um, you know, you find that the votes up until about 40 or 45 are pretty left-wing. It's only, you know, it's only after that actually they get more right-wing. Uh, even then, I don't. I must say, I don't quite understand it. Um, why it's quite as, um, as bad as it is, and also. I suppose at least some of it must be that people, middle class and upper class people, live longer than uh, the. No, but seriously, if you look at over 70, over 70 is a very high proportion of Tory voters. Now, I mean, we all know from our own anecdotal experience as well as from statistics that, particularly for men from working class backgrounds, so lots of them don't make it to 70 or, you know, it's much fun. But I don't know, I mean, I'm not a psychologist, I don't know what reasons people have for this, or, or whether it's just as people get older, they, you know, there's more like, they'll get more frightened about other things and prone to the kind of arguments that are put all the, put all the time. Um, I don't know what's going on that, but anyway, it's something very, it's obviously very interesting. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's very important that you do have, um, you do actually have a, a Labour leader who is making the case over things like war and who's making the case over Brexit. I mean, if you actually look at what Tony Blair is saying today about Brexit, basically. What he's saying is he's blaming absolutely everything that's happening on Brexit, most of which has nothing to do with Brexit, you know, like inequality, and, um, which are happening in, in every country. Um, and even, you know, low productivity. Well, how long has that been going on in Britain? And low investment. Well, neither of these are a product of the last year at all. So you've got him doing this, but essentially what they want to do is say, people made the wrong decision, they've got to change their minds. And they will keep on at this. And they will try and get their way over this, there's no question. That's what they've set up a new cross party group, which is, um, you know, right wing Chukra Muna, Labour, and uh, Anna Subri, who's supposedly left wing Tory, whatever that's supposed to mean. Um, and, you know, they will, they will harry any attempt to try to get uh, a leave vote. Now, I think it's, I just think the obvious thing people should be saying is that. Uh, you have to regard the vote as a serious vote. You can't treat people as idiots who didn't know what they were voting for. I mean, I think people had quite a lot of understanding in that particular referendum about what they were voting for and that they, um, you know, they didn't like the government. I know, you know, uh, I was brought up in West London in one of the boroughs that actually did vote no, one of the few boroughs that voted um, no to the EU in this, uh, in this election. And it's very interesting when you talk to people there because a lot of it is they don't like politicians and people who they regard as, you know, they've got low educational achievement, it's one of those areas, right? As they delightfully call it. Um, and they don't like people telling them what to do and experts coming and telling them what to do. I mean, that now, you can say that's good or bad. You could, but interestingly, talking to a friend of mine who said her niece voted for UKIP two years ago, vote for Jeremy Corbyn this time, who lives there, you know, I mean, and that's in Boris Johnson's constituency where his majority got cut in half from 10,000 to 5,000. And that tells you something, it tells you something of what's, uh, of what's going on. A young Asian student was the Labour candidate there, so it's, you know, it's an interesting sort of um, a process that, that's kind of going on in those places. But to my view is, Brexit has become the kind of thing that people say this is the most important issue. In my opinion, it's not the most important issue. It's a series of trading agreements. What is the most important issue is can we deliver health for people in this country? Can we deliver um, housing? Can we deliver um, schooling, which is decent? The answer to which appears to be no in every case. So the question isn't whether we're in our or out of the EU. The question is how are we going to rectify that situation? And that seems to me a much bigger question that we should be um, dealing with. Would I be more frightened to live in the States? <laughs> um, I don't know, I mean, I, look, I, I haven't been to the States for a few years, actually. I've always thought 
It la- the reason that things were more difficult in the States, it lacks any kind of Labour Party or anything like that. And that makes it much, much harder for people. And the trade unions are, I don't know if they are that much weaker than the trade unions here now. They're probably a bit, but, but not massively. At the same time, I think Americans have got a much healthier attitude towards democracy in general, and they're less... You know, they're less likely to put up with some of the rubbish we put up with over here, like the House of Lords, for example. So, you know, it kind of cuts, it cuts in different sorts of ways. I think the big problem is, I mean, not just that Trump got elected, but why did Trump get elected? Because the alternative was Hillary Clinton. Well, I, I mean, I could not have gone across the road to vote for Hillary Clinton. I wouldn't have voted for Trump, obviously. But I would not have voted for her under any circumstances, because what is the advantage of it? She takes you. She would have gone into wars quicker than Trump's done, for, I mean, not for reasons of principle, but she would have done. Um, she absolutely thinks it's all about, you know, it's all about allowing the sort of liberal wing of the capitalist class to do exactly what works. She gets millions from Wall Street and elsewhere, so people didn't like it. Now, there was an alternative, which was Sanders, and Sanders did very, very well. And I think if he'd been the candidate, he'd have beaten Trump. I think it, he appealed, he would have appealed to enough people who wouldn't vote for Trump, but he also would have appealed to some key groups of people. Well, the Democrats didn't want Trump. Exactly. exactly. They didn't want him because he took left hand, which is exactly the process they've been trying to do with, uh, with Jeremy. Yeah. Only they haven't succeeded over here for, mm-hmm. for a whole a number of reasons. So, no, and, and I think there, the American working class, this isn't a good situation with Trump, whether Trump can last, and, you know. But the American working class historically has a very good record of coming from nowhere and having these huge strike waves and campaigns and the movements in the 60s and all those sorts of things. And those people are still there, you know. That kind of idea is still there. So I think that's what we have to, you know, we have to put our hope in. But I mean, I agree. I think it's very, very difficult in terms of having Donald Trump as your president. I mean, can you imagine? Really, it must be, you know, very <laughs> That's not... Um, and just finally, I mean, Dragan raised the question about Trident and Jeremy Corbyn's compromise. I mean, to me, the whole manifesto was good, except on foreign policy and defence, where it's rubbish, really. It wasn't good at all. It was, you know, all right, they don't sort of say we're going to go into another war, but it's not good on any of these issues. And that's obviously not something that Jeremy thinks himself personally, but it is something that the majority of Labour has come to accept. And, of course, the manifesto becomes policy, good and bad bits of it. Now, it already was, well, it, it, it's tendentious, isn't it, whether it was trying to keep policy to renew Trident, but let's assume that it was. But that is definitely now going to be the case. So, no, it seems to me with all these things, this is why you need to stop the war coalition, it's why you need CND, it's why you need the People's Assembly, it's why you need all these sorts of things, because you know, relying on this, and there will be more of these compromises, if he becomes Prime Minister, there will be massive number of compromises that he'll be expected to make. I mean, it's bad enough he has to go and meet the King of Spain and all the other things that are a total waste of his time already. And, uh, you know, you can only think how much worse all, that, all of that side of it will get. And the way in which the British ruling class is so clever at co-opting people, by which I don't mean him personally, but the whole idea you know, we're really behind you, you can do it for a little while. I mean, it's what they did in 1924, you know, they're all going, they're all off to the palace, all these, you know, work, ex-manual workers, they're all off to the palace wearing their, you know, whatever they had to wear, their morning suits and all this kind of, oh, isn't King George lovely? And, you know, this is what happens to people, and they will try this, and if Jeremy Corbyn doesn't do it, they'll try and find somebody else who's more amenable to doing it in that kind of way. So I think... We need all these things outside, and we need socialist organisation. I mean, that's what Counterpart's about, and I think it's very... I, I feel at the moment that Marxist understanding is at an absolute premium in this situation, that we need to have, you know, more of these sorts of discussions and more of, you know, more reading and, and all this sort of thing. And I think socialist organisation's at an absolute premium. Socialist organisation, which, as we are very enthusiastic about Jeremy Corbyn, but also says, look, you know, this isn't going to happen without a mass movement and, and people who understand what is at stake here. I mean, there's tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of people in this country who do have some understanding of what's at stake here. But we need to get organised. You know, we're now, you know, the train has left the station and we can't, 
muck about anymore, really, is what I would say. So that's my thoughts on it.